You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. The suffering that I have endured has uniquely gifted me to care for other people going through the same thing. Hey, everybody. Welcome uh, to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for Youth and their adults, too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter and Suffering and Trauma. I'm your co-host, Erica Sorensen, along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Pastor Goodman, would you introduce our guest? We have with us uh, my my good friend, uh, our, my coworker. This is Deaconess Emma Hines. How you doing, Emma? I'm good. How are y'all? Thanks for having me. It's good to have you here. So, Emma, um, I, I got to meet you when you became our registrar. I got to know you as as a um, as a deaconess, as a theologian. Uh, but the more I get to know you, the more I want to talk to you about this particular subject. So, um, let everybody else a little bit too. Emma, would you would you tell us a little about yourself? Uh, yes. So I am. Uh, deaconess, lowercase d, d, deaconess. I don't have like a call yet, but i um, married to a current seminarian. We're expecting our first baby in January, which is super exciting. But the main reason that I think I'm here is because I am um, pretty familiar with the idea of suffering and how that plays into Christian living and suffering faithfully. Um, I have been struggling with depression for about a decade now, which is weird to say, Um, but I've dealt with all kinds of complications with grief and then depression and anxiety and navigating that not only as a young person figuring out what she wants to do with her life, but also as a um, Christian, as a faithful Lutheran and really understanding how Lutheran theology equips those who suffer and those who care for the suffering to continually point to Christ and get through it all day to day. It's it's something that gets harder to do the more you see. Um, I, I think sort of there's this um, there's this stereotype of the the Christian who who loves God so much because they've never really had too many problems in America. Um, and, and there's also sort of um, the recognition that once you stand sort of close enough to dark things, um, be it because of, of, of um, struggling with, with uh, mental illness, be, be it struggling with, with physical trauma, be it struggling with sin, death, and the power of the devil in this world, uh, it gets harder to reconcile what we see and feel with the concept of a loving God. And so the, the idea that we would want to actually be able to talk about this, be, be able to be, be faithful when so many things that are wrong are happening. It, it's, it's probably one of the biggest struggles that Christians have, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the interesting thing that I would tap into there that you said, um, or uh, that, that I wouldn't want to ask you about is, you you talked about this happening 10 years ago. And if you're only listening and you're not looking, Emma's not an old person. <laughs> so if I'm calculating correct, you're maybe middle school when this stuff sort of... Uh, freshman year of high school. I was 14. Or, okay. Okay. 14. Um, so she was not, she was not old. Um, and I, and, and I think one of the things that people struggle so much, even if they're Christian is, you know, suffering of any kind, um, it's not something, you know, I mean, being depressed is not your fault. It's not some, it's, it's not something that you did or, um, something that you earned just like most of the, a good deal of the suffering that happens in our life. I mean, we do cause ourselves our own problems and our own sufferings. I know this because sometimes I'm my own worst enemy, but in terms of mental illness or things, dark things that people do to us or bad things that happen to us, um, that's that's kind of the thing that I think a lot of people struggle with that are either Christian or outside of Christianity because 
we hear, um, you know, in John 3, 16, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only son to die for us. And all, you know, he's, he's doing these good things for us, but, but then why do we still suffer? He, Jesus came, God loves us. Why does he allow suffering? Why does a good God allow suffering? Why does this go on? What, yeah. do, you, what do you say to that? Um, yeah. On the one hand, God is God and he's going to do as he see fits. That doesn't mean that he delights in the suffering of his children. He doesn't. We know that. Um, and Christ's coming into the into human flesh to suffer and die and be raised from the dead, it works to take away the eternal consequences of sin, death, and the devil. But we're not at the resurrection yet, where we haven't been called home to Christ yet. And so while we live in a world that is racked with generations of original sin and terrible awfulness that we do to each other, we are, we're stuck living here. Um, we are given vocations by God, and I want to fulfill those faithfully, but I can't, either because I the original sin that lives within me or the fact that I have to deal with other sinners and they hurt me. We live in a world that like physically the earth, the ball that we live on is so broken by sin that natural disasters happen and sickness and illness happens. And the suffering that we experience specifically in the lives of Christians serves to redirect us back to God, to send us back to the open arms of Christ, because it, it, it makes us realize I can't save myself. I cannot do anything for myself. I try and it just gets worse. So suffering for Christians is the thing that drives us back to Christ, reminds us, convicts us and says, you can't do this but you don't have to do this. You don't have to try to save yourself because that already happened on a cross 2000 years ago. That that's a done deal. And so now when we face suffering, it's, it's not, I have to prove to God that I can overcome this. I have to prove to other people that the reason this is happening is not because my faith is in tatters. It is, I have, a helper. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the gifts of Christ here and now to get me through the day to day. And being like, I've seen even in just my short little lifetime, the suffering that I have endured has uniquely gifted me to care for other people going through the same thing. Being like, yes, it's awful. We're both in this pit together. It's terrible. But Jesus is here. <laughs> and if like I, I often talk about um, when you meet people who are suffering, your job is to bring Jesus to them. Mm -hmm. Or like if you can't bring them to Jesus, get Jesus to them. Hmm. That like that is the the job of Christians. The job of your brothers and sisters in Christ is to remind you, hey, this thing that you were made in your baptism means that you have a direct line to the guy who dealt with this already. Um, and it's just the life of the Christian is suffering and it is going to last until we die. But <laughs> we're looking forward to the resurrection. While before we get there, it's not going to be fun. But so there's this thing you did though. Um, yeah. I want to, there's so many things you said that, that are worth unpacking into a book. That was awesome. But um, the first thing you did when we talked about suffering is that you laughed at it. Um, and then from there uh, you said something that was hard to handle that, that God can do what he wants. He's in charge. And it's true. Um, even if it's not sort of helpful, but you immediately then went to, so when God does what he wants to a suffering, he, he assumes it himself. He, he goes to uh, the person of the son who bears the cross. Um, you laughed at suffering because I guess when you stand close enough to it, uh, after a while, it, I don't know if you get used to it or or, or it just sort of loses the, the thing that makes you so afraid of it. Maybe God's just not as afraid of suffering as we are, and he's willing to work within it a lot more than we would like him to. I don't know. What do you think? I, I would agree with that. I think um, what does God have to be afraid of death? Like, like He's, Can't you say that about you too, though? Right in Christ, but I mean it's a little different because I hundred <laughs> percent like yeah I'm yeah living with original sin in me and watching people I love die, and it's like ah, this is terrifying and awful, and anything could happen at any point. Um, it, it 
I, I laugh at it because it's one of my coping mechanisms, but it's, it's easy. It's easier to laugh at it. Cause it's like, yeah, it's just a thing that I have to deal with. It's a thing we all have to deal with. And rather than letting it color everything that I do, mm-hmm. I have something more to color everything that I see. And that is Christ. That is the gift he has given. That is my identity in Christ. And so I look at, I, I, I see suffering and I go, that really hurts and it's really not fun. And I'm mad at times and I'm sad at times that it's going on, but take heart. Christ has overcome the world. Yeah, I, I think this is sort of actually the the part of it that that's worth holding on to. Uh, not only because you know Jesus is a safe answer in these parts, but like so, um, there's there's like everybody's going to go to Job, um, who who suffered on on a supposed bet between God and the devil. Uh, my favorite part, I think, might actually be right at the end, um, when Job finally just gets fed up and, and actually sort of questions God's motives in this, and and God is actually sort of like he's. He, he, he's only angry when his motives are questioned behind suffering. Like, do you think that that he he kills and makes alive? He does what he wants. But like at the end of the day, the thing that that I think upsets him is the idea that that he would want Job to suffer and not be the one who suffers with him. The idea that that God sort of delights in suffering on our part rather than assuming it himself. That's that's where God finally loses his temper. The idea that we would sort of think God likes there to be suffering in this world and he's the one bringing it about uh, instead of just rather the one diving into it to help carry it. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance here about, mm-hmm. I mean, Emma, you were really clear and really honest about the fact that um, even though Christ died, and even though there's an answer to this at the end, at the resurrection, all things will be made new, this won't be a problem anymore, you still have depression. You, th- this still goes on in your, in your, in your daily life. And so um, just being a Christian doesn't necessarily fix this. Um, you also alluded beautifully to um, the incarnation of Jesus, who who suffered for us. So, can you can you tease that out a little bit more, just about how daily you kind of can connect to that? Yes, and how that helps you. I love this stuff. Um, yeah. So, in the incarnation, God sends His Son to die. So Jesus is conceived and born ultimately to die. Uh, but what that means is it, it's like when we confess it in the creed. It's very short. It's like two sentences and then we move on. But the reality is that Jesus lived a 30 plus year life. Um, And so he was born without sin, but into a sinful world. So every, like in a very kind of mundane way, Jesus has probably stubbed his toe at one point. (laughs) like Probably more than once. (laughs) If he was a toddler, you know, he fell down, he hit his head. Yeah. He was a carpenter by trade. He probably smacked his thumb with a hammer. And like Jesus yeah. felt pain. Jesus, yeah. but in living, he suffered perfectly, which doesn't mean he didn't suffer because we or know he, he suffered the one day. Right. No, it's yeah. not Holy Week. It's like his whole life up until that point. He suffered as much as a normal person would, and then even more so. But so, the, so a perfect life is not necessarily without suffering, but it is suffering without like cursing God. It is suffering without sin. And so Jesus living a human life perfectly means that he endured hunger. He endured thirst. He stubbed his toe. He felt the pain of death. He he lived every dirty aspect of life, but he did it perfectly. And so the incarnation, like one of the names that Jesus is given is Emmanuel, which means God with us. Like he's here. He, 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 it's not Jesus just happened to like be on earth for a little bit. No, he lived with people. He looked like us. He had our frame and in this perfect life still like it, it, it wasn't that Jesus like you said, it's not he only suffered the one day. He suffered the whole time, but in doing it, he shows us it's possible. Like you can suffering is going to happen, but you're not. I guess, the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. That's a half complete thought. It yeah, but it, it really divorces fault from burden and it also it also provides help. Um and when you can separate fault from burden, it, it's it's really freeing. Uh because now you're you're doing more than just sort of always looking for for somebody else to blame. Um and recognize that there's some things in this world you're gonna have to carry, and that's actually the greatest act of love. Uh but more than that, um if you can separate fault from burden, that means when it is your fault, uh it doesn't entirely have to be your burden. Um it, it, it means that that be it just sort of something that you're wrestling with that was done to you something that that's just sort of so ground into the dust of creation that there's no even like short of blaming adam i got nothing and then there's the, the stuff that you just you did wrong um but now when when it comes to burden um god enters the picture now to carry it um it, it, it robs suffering uh, of the thing that it would want to do more than anything and that's own us mm -hmm. yeah it doesn't have the final answer Right, for sure. Um, it doesn't have the final answer. And how does that sort of, how does that help you as you, as you struggle and will continue to struggle throughout your life? Um, in the, I'm not alone in this, um, specifically mm. with depression, because uh, I have experience with that. The thing that depression seeks to do is isolate you. Um, and when the devil is using it to isolate you, both physically and spiritually, it's a hot, it's an awful hot mess. It's not anything I would want for anyone else. But it, even in the days where I don't want to be alive and I don't care that I'm supposed to want to care for other people, Christ is there too. He, he's... He has, he's there on the cross. Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why I like the King James version. Why hast thou forsaken me? Um, and David is, when he writes this, he's in the pit of despair. It's bad. Jesus cries out these, these words. It's bad. And yet Jesus doesn't sin. He says, why have you left me? He says to his father, with whom he is still God because of the two natures thing, why forsaken me? And so it's kind of a little bit freeing in those dark moments of, I'm allowed to say, hey, God, you put your name on me in baptism. Where are you? Hmm. Where, where, I know you, you're not going to leave me, but where, what are you doing? Why, hey. Hi. Hello, I need help in the back. <laughs> Hello. Um, so it's, it, it, it helps, I guess, for me, kind of put it into perspective that like, I, I, I'm not, my suffering is not unnoticed by a God that loves me. It's it's actually it's profound. Um, every worldview, if you're religious or atheist, you have to like sort of or sooner or later confront the fact that it it hurts down here a lot. Um, and it seems like most of them are either trying to sort of pass it off, find balance somewhere, or blame something. But but with Christianity, there there's a unique gift here. Like like you said, you're allowed to feel it, to be hurt by it, to struggle with it, but to to find an answer in it in a God who who actually leans into suffering instead of further away. Like suffering is not a, a proof that something has gone wrong, but rather a proof that God is near now, right? Yes, absolutely. And we see this in in our daily life. Like not only, uh, yeah, we know about the parts where Jesus was on the earth walking around and talking and you could like touch him and stuff, but then he ascends into heaven. And, and mm. some people would say, see, he's left you again. It's like, no, he went into heaven so he could be everywhere at once. So he could be on the altar every Sunday. I get to eat Jesus and he's there and it's a reminder that like no he's not far off he's not far away he's in my mouth and it might not taste good um lutherans have the bad bad communion wine it's a thing but i don't know where there is good communion wine though not that i've gone shopping but yeah no. fair enough <laughs> different, different <laughs> topic uh, but like i i i have that in my body literally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can depend on it. He's he giving you a, he, he's, he, he keeps pointing you back and letting you know that you are totally dependent on him and you're going to go be able to go somewhere to receive. You can still receive him and you can still have the gift and know that you're not alone. Absolutely. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And there's also this element of, um, 
St. Paul talks about very, or just in scripture in general, bearing one another's burdens in love. Um, and we see this most clearly in baptism. Most, hmm. when you're baptized as a baby, I didn't at two months crawl into church and go, I'd like to be dumped in that cold water, please. <laughs> My parents dragged me there. And chances are you have seen baptisms where the baby is just kicking and screaming the entire time because at up until that moment they're suffering and they're like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I don't have full conscious thought right now, but I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Your parents bring you to the waters of baptism. When I, I was blessed in the way that when my depression was at its worst at the very beginning, I still lived at home and mm -hmm. my parents made me go to church. I cried through every single church service for about mm, three years and could not, like, I could not have anyone touch me. I was so overcome with everything, but I was there. They made sure I was there. They made sure that I was getting the goods, that I was receiving forgiveness of sins, that I was receiving Christ's body and blood. And even if in that moment it didn't feel like it was doing anything, it was still happening. It was still for me in the midst of being alone. And so when we have people who do struggle, whether it's with mental illness, chronic illness, or just I'm having a bad time, the body of Christ is the body of Christ. Um, if the body of Christ stubs their toe, everyone's going to feel it. And we're supposed to. And it's, it's an opportunity for those who are not in the midst of suffering to surround our brothers and sisters and say, we are here also for you. Mm -hmm. We're it in is, it with you. Yeah. It's not just Jesus. For, like it is Jesus for you, but it is also a physical thing of we're here to make sure that you don't forget whose you are and what hmm. has been won for you. I think you just answered the question I wanted to ask. Um, you don't need to be a Christian to offer compassion to your neighbor. And in fact, you know, um, I think sort of the stereotypical attacks against Christians is that we're bad at it. Um, how, how do how do Christians offer compassion in a unique way than the rest of the world? Um, I, we, we do it um, in the way, in a way that mimics Christ uh, in, in a sense that I'm going to be like, I'm going to come into this pit where you are with you and I'm not going to leave you alone. Mm -hmm. I, I think it, especially the Lutheran perspective, but other Christians get this as well. We don't, hide from suffering we don't try to sweep it under the rug we don't try to say oh well if you just pray a little bit it'll go away there's a very real recognition of this is actually happening to you this is valid your pain is valid this mm -hmm. this is going on we should be first responders right yes yes yeah. but, but we bring jesus go away yeah. i don't have a time machine to go back and fix it but i I, I can be for a little bit a poor substitution of Christ and be here. But that's, I mean, that's just it. We, we, you said at the very beginning that, that uh, when somebody is hurting, you bring Jesus to them, even if you can't bring them to Jesus, the, the rest of the world, um, they, they can try and alleviate the suffering. And that's, that's sometimes that's good to do. It genuinely is. Um, but to actually bring the sufferer to the suffering, um, it, it's, there's something there, I think. Yeah, I wanted to, um, that was a really good uh, way to talk about how we can help others who are suffering. Um, and I want to give you the opportunity to um, talk to anybody that may be listening, because um, we ha we know that Gen Z is suffering, is suffering with some um, mental illness, um, struggles, if not mental illness, some depression, um, the m more than has been reported previously in any generation. So what would you, what would you say to, um, you know, a kid who is struggling with this themselves right now, whether believer or unbeliever, what would you say? Uh, I'm sorry that this is happening to you. <laughs> I, I think quite honestly, like this is not supposed to be happening. You're right. Uh, the, the reason you feel like something is wrong, that is a correct suspicion. Um, but there are, there are options for like, everyone says, oh, there's options for you, but, but there are, there, there are people who genuinely want to help. Um, and specifically for 
Christians, for believers who are like the church is only very recently really talking about mental illness specifically well and i'm very in favor of that and it's like okay how do we foster more of those discussions but don't be afraid to use the means that god has given and not necessarily the means of grace but the means of um mental health professionals and in some cases medication in some cases just the people God has put around you. It's terrifying. They're like the first, people will say the first step to getting better is asking for help or admitting you have a problem. And it's like, that's the hardest part because it means not only do I have to tell my mom, hey, you love me and pray for me every day, but I don't want to be alive. But then there's also this real thing that I, I myself have to deal with of, I can't save me. I can't do this. And so kind of saying to these kids who are dealing with this, it is scary, but don't try to do it by yourself because that's more scary. Um, and, and that's yeah. the devil trying to isolate you. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's also, yeah, it, it's gonna, you're probably going to be, once you ask for help, you're probably going to be more uncomfortable before you get better. Because if your parents or loved ones are not aware that this is going on, they now also have to deal with the fact of what did I do that this child feels this way? <laughs> what is, like? But again, it, we want to divorce blame and burden all over again. Absolutely. But I, I, parents feel this way. Oh, uh, yeah. They can't help I would. it. Yeah. 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 But I mean, nobody feels forgiveness. We have to be told forgiveness. Nobody, nobody is is told reconciliation. We have to to be reconciled. Right. Um, there, there's an outside of yourself thing that's happening here that that's worth proclaiming and worth noting. Absolutely, and um, just when sometimes parents will say, "Well, what what do you wish your parents had done?" And that list is we don't. That's too long. We don't need to get into all of that. But but but. I, <laughs> There, there is this element of like, forgive and be forgiven, confess and receive absolution because having depression is not a sin. Like I'm, I don't have depression because I did something, but I can sin in the way I handle it. Um, and also realizing that, like that part is equally as uncomfortable, but it is key to this, like, I'm still responsible for what I think, say, and do, even while I'm having a bad time. So being open and honest and confessing, I, in my, because I was having a bad depression day, I didn't do my homework and I'm sorry I didn't do that. And now I'm failing a class. Like that's on me. There's other stuff going on, but but just being sure to separate, of, separate, depression as a result of sin in like the sense that I did something and but and then also like going forward I I'm going to sin more possibly because I'm I have this diagnosis and because you're a sinner because we all are yeah you're yeah, yeah. Okay. Right. every yeah. sin is met with the same and cross though your right. your sins yes. now but but also your future ones are, are for are forgiven. They're already forgiven. Absolutely. You haven't even done it yet and it's forgiven. And that means that as you're facing this, it, it's not a, I'm going to ruin this. Uh, it, it is insurmountable, but it's, it's already finished. It's already conquered. And so it's going to hurt, but hurt is no longer the mark of defeat, but still it's the mark of victory. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would go back to your, you, you quoted, um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eventually Jesus says it is finished. Mm -hmm. It is finished. And that's a great comfort. To all of us, because that means our, our, our sins are as far from us as the East is from the West. God remembers them no more. Rest in that. Yes. Yeah. Well, this so, has been fantastic. Are we done? I'm sad yeah, that we're done. I wanted one, to, I could but... talk to her though all day. This is fantastic. I, I, this was the only thing I've got a dinner thing, but I, what do you want to talk about? I'm here. <laughs> Well, we, we can talk after, but we'll do, we'll do our wrap up because I would like to talk to you all day. It'd be fantastic. Um, Emma Hines, thank you. So Deaconess Emma Hines, small D, soon to be big deaconess. 
Yes. Right? <laughs> um, thank you for joining us today to talk about faith in the flesh for this disembodied age. It has been an absolute delight. Pastor Goodman, you have anything to say? No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank oh, you. I'm, he's speechless. This this does not you happen. I am speechless. Good job. High five. I, well, sometimes I do that, and I think it's just because he's uh, amazed by my idiocy. But no. I don't think it's your idi- idiocy he's amazed by. No. No. <laughs> I, when, when we end on hope, I'll be content, and and we did. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.